Hello, everyone. My name is Bijan Ahmadi. I'm the Executive Director at the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy, and I'm honored to moderate this panel with three distinguished experts, Professor Robert Ross, Dr. Jeffrey Reeves, and Dr. Rachel Odell. Uh, this is the first panel discussion we're hosting in 2021. We decided to organize uh, this first panel of uh, the year on U.S.-China relations, as we believe it is perhaps the most important bilateral relationship on the international stage, and the dynamics of this bilateral relationship will perhaps shape the world around us uh, and affect the international order for decades to come. Uh, I'll, take, uh, I'll try to uh, take your uh, questions as well uh, as we uh, go through this discussion. And to send in your questions, please use the Q&A uh, feature that's available on Zoom. Uh, before I introduce our panelists, let me briefly talk about our institute uh, the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy, or IPD, is a nonpartisan, nonprofit Canadian uh, foreign policy think tank dedicated to promoting sustainable peace through diplomacy, dialogue, and constructive engagement. Uh, through its publications, conferences, policy briefings, and recommendations, IPD will encourage policymakers and leaders in government, civil society, and business community to adopt a more restrained and open minded approach in managing the strategic challenges and geopolitical risk of the 21st century. Among our audience today, we have policymakers, current and former diplomats, researchers and think tankers, parliamentarians, uh, business leaders and journalists. To everyone tuning in, thank you for your attendance. Uh, now, let me briefly introduce our uh, panel of experts. I'm only going to uh, read a brief part of their bios. The full versions uh, are available on our website. Um, Robert Ross is a professor of political science at Boston College, an associate and executive committee member of the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University. His research focuses on Chinese security and defense policy, East Asian security, and U.S.-China relations. Rachel Odell is a research fellow in the East Asia program at the Quincy Institute and an expert in U.S. strategy toward Asia, Chinese foreign policy, and maritime disputes. She was an international security fellow in the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard Kennedy School from 2019 to 2020. And also she previously worked as a research analyst in the Asia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Jeffrey Reeves is the vice president of research at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. Prior to joining APF Canada, he was the director of Asian studies at the United States Army War College. He has direct experience living and working in Asia and different institutions, including as a university instructor at Peking University in China. Uh, to start the discussion, I would like to ask each panelist to provide us with their high level assessment of the current state of US-China relations and how they think the Biden administration will shape uh, US policy toward China. Uh, we start with Robert, please go ahead, Robert. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, in some respects, I prefer you ask me that question a month from now. We are in a period of great flux. We're all trying to read the tea leaves of the Biden administration. And every time someone makes a comment, we say, what are the implications for the future? And we've heard a mixed messages. We've heard people say that we stick to our one China policy, but we've heard leaders say that we're going to impose costs on China for China's Taiwan policy. We've had members of the Pentagon say we want, there's no need for tension in US-China relations over Taiwan. We've heard people say that we should cooperate on climate change, but at the same time, we've heard others say we need to reestablish American supremacy. So there are a lot of mixed voices coming out. Now, some of this we could interpret simply as a new administration looking for its footing, um, haven't really established a China policy, with perhaps some people inexperienced in the in the language of US-China relations. Um, also, there is a tendency of any new administration to lay down some markers for domestic politics. We're not soft on China, we're tough on China. Let's get our credentials in line, and then it might be easier to make some decisions later on. Finally, given the domestic context of US-China relations in the United States, it's probably better to focus not on what the administration says, because it will need to be far more hard line than maybe it actually is. So that we want to focus on what the administration is doing. How frequently we do transits down the Taiwan Strait. Are Trump's arms sales coming to Taiwan? Are they going to arrive quickly or are they going to be prolonged? 
Our visits to Taiwan far less provocative than they had been under Trump. What about the freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea? Will they be as frequent? And what about the language of the administration and when you get into the nuance? So there are many ways for the administration to move that we may not see in their vocabulary, in their speeches, but the Chinese will notice. They'll watch what we do rather than what we say. So we really have to pay close attention going forward. But right now, it's fair to say things are in flux. And having said that, we're all waiting for the president's foreign policy speech today. Thank you, Robert. Rachel, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. And I <clears throat> will just kind of pick up where where um, Robert left off and just second what he said. And actually, uh, Biden's foreign policy speech this day will probably be, give us some interesting indicators. And um, in fact, he may have already given it, but it was right around this time. And some excerpts that were released earlier this day, earlier today, um, that I saw I didn't actually mention China, but by name, but they, you know, alluded to it. And I think one of the quotes that's most interesting is when, after emphasizing the importance of alliances, which has been a priority throughout the Biden campaign, it's, it's sort of restoring alliances in many ways was at the heart of Biden's rhetoric on foreign policy. That he says, but leading with diplomacy must also mean engaging our adversaries and our competitors diplomatically where it is in our interests and advances the security of the American people. And I think that there's probably a couple of things if we really want to read those tea leaves that you could deduce from that. One is that um, the phrase adversaries and competitors, I would guess is in many ways referring to, uh, is probably trying to make room for China to not necessarily be an adversary, but rather a competitor. And then I also think that it's um, suggesting that there, we will, there will be a return to more normal diplomacy with China than there was under the Trump administration. So certainly they're taking their time, you know, as far as we know, President Biden and, and President Xi have not yet spoken over the phone. And I think that will, you know, that will happen eventually and before too long, but it's, it, they're not prioritizing that right up front. And in the confirmation hearings, you know, we saw, we heard a lot of tough rhetoric and an indication from Secretary Blinken that the Trump administration was right in taking a tougher stance on China and that they just were doing it wrong and that we will sort of do it better. So I think that they're, they're trying to signal that there's not going to be a clear break, but at the same time, I do expect that over time we'll gradually see a resumption of more concrete working level dialogue and that that will have, you know, positive consequences for the relationship. And, you know, I think that as part of this, there's going to be a priority placed on cooperating in areas that dovetail with the Biden administration's broader foreign policy priorities, which even those foreign policy priorities, again, restoring alliances, bolstering democracy, there's some sort of general watchwords so far, but it's a little bit unclear what, what exact form um, they'll take in concrete terms. I, I think what's far clearer is that they're trying to make foreign policy serve the interests of the American people. And that's the, the phrase they keep returning to. And those pri domestic priorities or those overall priorities are dealing with the pandemic, um, re uh, bolstering the economy, dealing with climate change and racial justice. So I think that to the extent that China, you know, relates to all of those, um, I think that the Biden administration will try to uh, relate to China in ways that promotes those underlying core interests. And China will be less the focus of US U.S. policy generally than it, than it was over the last year in particular, where it became the kind of punching bag of the Republican Party and of the Trump administration, even in much more domestically oriented conversations. So I think we'll hear probably less about China, um, and the emphasis will be on being, being more competitive uh, at domestically and, um, you know, working with on a more piecemeal basis. Now, whether that's the right approach, we can talk more about as the, as the uh, webinar goes on, and I'm looking forward to doing that. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Jeff, please go ahead. Sure. Uh, batting cleanup. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can add some value to some of the points that were raised. Uh, really, I, I mean, fundamentally, I agree that uh, um, it's probably a little bit early in, in the day to try to, to make a comment on what uh, Biden administration is going to do with respect to China. Uh, and and I, I think it's quite likely that we're not going to see a clear path forward for a number of months, maybe even years, as the Biden administration sets most of its energy and political capital on addressing the, the COVID pandemic in the United States. Uh, that, that domestic priorities will, will take, I think, the majority of his focus uh, and his team's focus in, in the short to medium term. Uh, that said, I think there are certain signposts and indicators worth noting, some of which uh, the other speakers have raised. 
the first I think that's really important to point to is with, with respect to staff, the people that he's been putting in place, both at the, the senior and the junior levels. You know, at the cabinet level, whether with respect to Tony Blinken at state, Janet Yellen at Treasury, uh, Lloyd Austin at Defense, Linda Thomas-Greenfield at the UN, there does seem to be a degree of lockstep uh, of agreement between the senior, senior officials that China remains a strategic challenger and that a tough-ish type approach is still going to be required to manage the bilateral relationship. You know, uh, I think uh, um, uh, Rachel raised the idea or raised the point of Blinken's comments at his Senate confirmation that, that Trump had the right idea but the wrong approach towards China. I think that's a, a really good indication that we're not going to see uh, what some people talked about is this potential uh, rapprochement between the two states going forward uh, that was speculated perhaps under the, the Biden administration. Uh, further, I think there's really good indications from Blinken and Thomas Greenfield that human rights issues and democracy are going to become more of a focus of U.S. policy towards China, whether with respect to Xinjiang, uh, Hong Kong or Taiwan. And Yellen's comments about the U.S. Uh, being fully prepared to use the full array of tools against an abusive China uh, practices suggest continued tension in the bilateral economic relationship going forward. I think at the operational or at the staffing level, I think we see a far more experienced group of actors than in the Trump administration, uh, many of which had long policy and academic careers. And I think we can assume at least a higher degree of professionalism within the U.S. bureaucracy towards China. That said, I think I'm, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about groupthink among key policymakers as the Biden China team is primarily composed of academic and policy people from the Council on Foreign Relations, the Center for American Progress and the Center for Naval Analysis, many of whom have worked together for years and who would have had key roles in a Hillary Clinton administration. Uh, this isn't at, at all to diminish their qualities uh, uh, because there are a lot of very clever people now in key roles at state on the State Department's policy planning staff and at the Pentagon. Uh, many are, however, creatures of Washington and in that they're going to be working in policy for decades. And, and as such, they have a particular view of, of China that's going to inform their policymaking and their engagement approaches. I guess this kind of brings me to uh, my last point is what, what can we expect with Biden with respect to China policy? Again, it's worth looking at some of the key people and distilling the thinking that ostensibly landed them their, their key positions. Uh, with respect to the senior director at China at the State Department's policy planning staff, Mira Rapp Hooper, for example, I think there's going to be a lot of focus on alliances and partnerships, which she's called the Shields of the Republic in a recent book on American policy towards Asia and China. With respect to the Pentagon's chief principal advisor on China matters, Eli Ratner, and the new Indo-Pacific czar, Kirk Campbell, I think there's going to be an emphasis on finding new ways to deal with China outside the past paradigm that broad engagement would lead to internal liberalization, a point the two raised together in a foreign affairs piece in 2018. And I think somewhat ironically here is the fact that, that the Biden team chose Kirk Campbell to act as an Indo-Pacific czar when he's arguably the principal strategic architect behind two major U.S. policy stumbles in the Asia Pacific under the Obama administration, specifically the pivot to Asia, which failed to institutionalize a non-military U.S. approach to Asia, and the strategic patient strategic patience approach to North Korea's nuclear development, which arguably provided Pyongyang with the space it needed to develop actionable nuclear weapons. Uh, lastly, with the appointment of people like Melanie Hart to state and Kelly Megsmas into the Pentagon, I think there'll be a lot more focus on the need to address certain domestic issues, such as greater government investment in STEM education and research and development and tech development as part of a comprehensive approach to China. And indeed, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan outlined a four pillar approach to China in a speech at the Atlantic Council last Friday that focused on these four components, right? Alliances, domestic reform, including democratic reform and strengthening in the United States, st uh, tech and STEM development, and clarity and intent towards China. So my last point, uh, what should the Biden administration not do? A short answer, it shouldn't follow the anonymous author's advice in the longer telegram to undermine Xi Jinping's uh, position as chairman of the Chinese Communist Party by identifying and manipulating internal tensions within the party. This approach is a little better, better than I think the direct appeal for regime change that former Secretary of State Pompeo made on multiple occasions and would indeed be seen in Beijing and among the Chinese people as an existential challenge. I think the, the Biden administration should also not move too aggressively on Taiwan as any unilateral change to the status quo will likely lead to significant blowback from Beijing for the people of Taiwan. So just to make sure that that policy is well thought out. And with that, I'll, I'll conclude.
Thank you, Jeff. Um, Robert, uh, some experts say that the Biden administration needs to create a coalition to deal with China. There have been uh, talks of frameworks such as an alliance of democracies, B10, or revival of the Quad, the quadrilateral lateral security dialogue consisting of US, Japan, Australia, and India. Uh, do you think the Biden administration will form new alliance frameworks to deal with China? And is there enough support among US regional allies for a tougher US-led coalition against China? Well, the Quad is basically the diplomatic instrument for diplomacy associated with the Indo-Pacific strategy. So if you think of the Indo-Pacific strategy, it's India, Australia, Japan, the United States. Um, and that's been made clear in many documents. We make passing references to other countries within East Asian waters. But it's clear that we are looking for partners outside East Asian waters who have two characteristics that enable us to cooperate. One, they're far from China, relatively speaking, or in Japan's case, more capable. That gives them greater confidence to cooperate more with us and incur some Chinese resistance. Second, it gives us access to capabilities that are far from China and therefore more secure. There's a general recognition that American facilities or access to facilities, Singapore, Philippines, South Korea, are no longer assured because of the rise of China. And so we're moving out. So those countries, India, Australia, Japan, yes, there is a good likelihood that these countries will cooperate more with us in dealing with China. They'll be happy to get past the Trump administration rhetoric that interfered with their ability to both have good relations with China, manage relations with China, but also enhance strategic cooperation with the United States. So the Biden administration will allow both, just as this bilateral policy with China is going to look to cooperate and compete, the other countries are going to do the same and will welcome the reduced tension, but we can count on their cooperation. Um, coalition building, yes, um, but there are many different aspects, economic coalition building with Europe, for example, but yes, we're going to move forward with India, Australia, um, Japan, and other countries in the region may feel slighted, but the trend is less cooperation with them anyway. Thanks, and um, I've asked the other panelists if you want to weigh in at any point on any of the questions, just please feel free to jump in. Um, well, I'll just note one quick thing is that I, I do, I think there have been some early markers like, like Jeffrey referred to where um, I believe it was uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan specifically noted that the Quad would form the, the, the cornerstone of U.S. security, security cooperation uh, going forward for the Biden administration. So I do think we're likely to see a continued emphasis on that. Um, and, and, and yet, you know, they, he also, I think they've also stressed that the goal is for that not to be as focused on only, you know, using these allies to contain China, but also just to strengthen the security relationship um, for its own, on its own terms. We'll see if, you know, if they actually are successful in shifting that emphasis. If I could just kind of do two finger there, uh, I, I would just caution the idea that the United States is going to bring India on side with respect to a strategic approach to the Asia Pacific, which of course is one of the foundational members of the Quad and, and certainly sees value in, in that dialogue and engagement. And you know, bilateral and multilateral exercises, military exercises and engagement with the other Quad members. But of course, India has a, a famously uh, independent streak in its foreign policy that can be demonstrated all the way back through, through the Cold War. And it doesn't necessarily share, I think, all of the same strategic outlooks that other Quad member states do with respect to the region. Uh, it's very much, uh, I think, still focused on, uh, on its relationships with Pakistan as being the primary security uh, uh, input into its strategic decision making. I mean, it's still largely based uh, on land forces in terms of its overall force structure. It is developing, I think, a very sizable Navy. But at this point, it, and, and of course, there's internal instability around what's happening in, in uh, around the Modi administration and Hindu nationalism that needs to be taken into consideration when we do talk about you know, like-minded partners and, and uh, being at the heart of these, these quad or these D10 structures that we've been floating as, as potential diplomatic and security arrangements in, in the Indo-Pacific or the Asia-Pacific. So I, I think that John, that, that that always some disagreement debates helpful. So I disagree with Jeffrey on this. I think this is a function of old thinking. When the Chinese Navy starts spending a lot of time in, in the vicinity of Indian territorial waters and beginning to 
have access and perhaps challenge sea lanes of communication and trade routes going past India, we're seeing a whole new approach to India regarding defense cooperation with the United States. And, and, and yet, counter, counterintuitively, you know, I think what's interesting is that the concept of the free and open Indo-Pacific is kind of the ideological heart of the Quad, or it became that over time, yes. which is ostensibly entails freedom navigation, you know, but but India has very different ideas about what maritime freedom navigation of means. Of course. So you know, India is the on the States other side does. of the United States when it comes to access to the EZ, for example, in 200 miles. But that's all well and good. The big challenge for India is the fact that the Chinese are spending more time in the waters. And so we're seeing new U.S.-Indian defense agreements, our naval agreements. We're seeing India build up the defense facilities and islands near the Moroccan Strait. We're seeing new... U.S. Indian naval um, exercises, things we never would have seen five years ago. Now, this is going to be a glacial pro process because the Indian, as, as Jeffrey was suggesting, have a long history of non-alignment, and that's part of their domestic political culture. Um, and there will not be American presence on Indian territory, but there will be access to their port facilities, which is growing. And all this is new. And for both countries, it's, it's critical because the Americans no longer are confident in our ability to uh, prevent Chinese dominance in the South China Sea. So now we're turning our attention to the perimeters and the peripheries of the South China Sea, only the Indian Ocean, Southern Indian Ocean with Australia and the Western Pacific. And the Indians play a critical role there. And the Indians are more than happy to have the United States patrol their waters instead of India. And you mentioned the border problem to Pakistan. The Indians see the Chinese hidden hand behind that and just raises Indian threat protection, um, which they never had before about China in maritime waters, by the way. So we're seeing a new threat protection in maritime areas in the vicinity of India, which is another driver of cooperation. So it's both Pakistan, China's relationship with Pakistan, and the maritime issues that are both um, growing of concern to India that's driving a policy. But Rachel's right. We have differences in the law of the sea. But in the larger scheme of things, we don't pay much attention to the law of the sea. Thank you. Um, Rachel, um, I'll ask you this question and I'll ask other panelists to weigh in as well. Uh, Jeff uh, briefly uh, mentioned the longer uh, telegram that was recently published. You co-authored a paper recently titled Toward an Inclusive and Balanced Regional Order in New US Strategy in East Asia. Uh, recently, there was uh, this, this paper published by the Atlantic Council titled The Longer Telegram. Uh, many are comparing it to George Cannon's 1946 piece. Uh, there is a fundamental difference between the set of recommendations in uh, these two papers that I want to ask you about. In your piece, uh, you're suggesting that the US needs a more realistic and stabilizing strategy in East Asia. And you say that this realistic strategy will require the US to commit itself to replacing its strategy of dominance in the region. The longer telegram on the other hand suggests that the United States, and I actually quote this part, the United States core objective must be the retention of US global and regional strategic primacy for the century ahead. Do you think, and Jeff mentioned this briefly uh, in, in his opening remarks as well, do you think the Biden team, or more broadly, Washington, is ready to shift U.S. regional posture away from the pursuit of primacy and regional dominance? So you start, Rachel, and then I'll ask the other panelists to weigh. Yeah, so I think, you know, there's, there's the question of what my views are and what I think the Biden administration's views are. I think that there's probably a wide range of perspectives on the Biden team. I, I think one, one thing I would pluck out that, that maybe has been less commented on is that uh, in a foreign affairs article that Jake Sullivan wrote with Kurt Campbell uh, last year, there was uh, an explicit discussion, or well, I should say implicit discussion of this question where in particular reference to military posture in the Asia Pacific, um, they favored adopting a more what, what you might call a more denial oriented approach or sort of active using using some of the same asymmetric capabilities that China has used in what's called an anti-axis area denial strategy um, against China as uh, which you know they didn't say like explicitly we shouldn't strive for primacy but that's that's it was sort of code word for maybe maintaining dominance all the way up to the Chinese coast is no longer should no longer be the priority of US military in Asia 
that maybe we should rethink the way that we approach the region. Now, whether that reflects a broader sort of grand strategic willingness to rethink the US role in, in the world and in the region, I, I don't know. Um, but I'll just say that I think that it's that the, you know, the longer, the view in the longer telegram, which I'll just note, it's not, it's not other people comparing it to George Kennan's telegram. It's the author it's himself or herself comparing, making that comparison, which um, seems uh, maybe a, a little bit much, but the, the problem, uh, the problem there is, I think that there's just a lack of awareness of reality that already in the region, the United States is have no longer has primacy. This is especially true in the economic domain, but even in the military realm, a growing like countries increasingly view, view, the, view the United States more as uh, sort of an offshore balancer almost. And I've heard this from, from Korean partners and, and others in the region where they, they still want the United States to maintain that commitment and that presence. But the reality of Chinese power is something the United States has not fully grappled with yet. And I think that's most keenly represented in this telegram, which tries to sort of um, evade the, the question by focusing on these arcane elite politics, which um, you know, I'm skeptical of the analysis there, but I think the broader strategic problem is that the United States needs to think about what's a good strategy if when primacy is no longer in the offing. And it's already no longer in the offing, but especially for the next century to come. And until we grapple with that basic reality, I don't think we'll be able to make effective strategy. So, you know, that's what we try to do in the report you were mentioning is, is lay out an alternative path forward. Robert or Jeff, if you want to weigh in on this question, please go ahead. Sure. I think Rachel's 100% correct. Um, but let me try and think of some of the implications of that. Um, one, you're seeing countries in the region cooperating less with the United States. One, because they feel they need to cooperate more with China as a rising power. And two, because they're feeling greater independence from the United States because of their own resilience and capabilities. So in South Korea, you're seeing China and South Korea cooperate against the United States regarding American policy toward North Korea. Both are saying to the United States, drop your policy. Well, that's in some respects simply re reflects the reduced importance of South Korea, of the United States to South Korean security, because the United States is less powerful. And you're seeing that around the region, uh, willingness to say no to the United States. But then second, we need to be careful as we're watching this trend develop to avoid a Cold War analogies. The Cold War analogy would have been who's on whose side in a polarized region. And the differences between Europe and Asia are so profound that the likelihood, or even we're moving in a direction not of polarization, but rather of a lot of fluidity in relationships. Singapore is going to have good relations with both countries. So is the Philippines. So is South Korea. So is Japan. And we're going to have trade relations and cultural relations across the great powers. And this is a much healthier way to move into a bipolar region, if you will, with greater prospects for cooperation and mutual gain and less costs as we gear up for arms races. So the American world is fixated on containing China as if it's a Cold War problem, which we shouldn't do. Um, and rather, we need to understand that this is going to be a fluid realm. But third, Rachel's right. We haven't come to grips with this yet. The debate in Washington is very much, we need to strengthen our alliances. Well, how do you do that when you're, relatively speaking, a declining power and every country in the region can see it and wants to cooperate more with China as a result? And so until we come to grips with the rise of China and the emergence of greater parity, we're not going to have an effective diplomacy for the region, an effective defense policy for the region, and an effective China policy. I would just add to that with respect to the longer telegram. One of the, the sentences that really stood out when I read this was, the US mission towards China should seek to return China to its pre-2013 path uh, by dealing with uh, Xi Jinping. Now, I mean, that's a huge assumption with respect to leadership agency, right? You remove one leader and everything falls into place as it used to be, or this idea that she has single-handedly moved the Communist Party towards a you know, domestic and foreign policy that is far less amenable to US interests than under his, his predecessors. But I mean, that, that does simply reflect the fundamental inability to, to accept the fact that you know, 2021 is not 2013, and we're never going to be able to rewind the clock to the point where China has become more, I think, willing to engage with the US 
in particular on on that that degree of relationship that existed in 2013 the, the balance of power in the region has changed too fundamentally china has demonstrated at least to its own domestic audiences success with its model of governance and economic development uh, that that contrasts very well against what's happening in western states like the united states particularly when you look at things like uh, the pandemic response or the ability to deal with economic recovery post pandemic or pre pandemic or during pandemic so all of those issues i think remain um, very different than what China was sitting in, in 20, 2012 and certainly uh, uh, reflect a new reality that has to be taken into consideration when, when Washington is making its policy towards not only China, but towards Asia. Thanks. Um, Jeff, uh, let me ask you a question about uh, human rights concerns that exist both in Canada, in US, and perhaps uh, in all uh, liberal democracies. In one of your recent articles, which is focused on Canada-China relations, you talk about Canada's concerns about human rights in China, but specifically here, I want to uh, talk about U.S. approach on uh, this issue. Uh, now, in the previous administration, uh, there was a sense that human rights was being used to advance the U.S. position in its strategic competition with Beijing. How can the Biden administration and overall U.S. allies, including Canada, be effective in addressing human rights concern in China, in concerns in China, including in Hong Kong or in Xinjiang? I mean, that's a, that's a great question. I think um, with respect to the United States, uh, certainly moving the, the dialogue away from a strategic messaging tool as it was under the Trump administration is going to be the first step, right? Uh, I think that the fact that Blinken has raised human rights and uh, and democracy and democratic uh, promotion in some instances in, in some of the comments that he's he's made so far publicly is a good indication that this is going to be front and center in the Biden administration's approach to China. Uh, and there will be a, an opportunity, I think, to to push forward that dialogue in, in multiple different channels. And I think that the Biden administration needs to do it in, in the venues that make sense. You know, I think. The, the argument that I made in the, the um, piece in the South China Morning Post is that for a state like Canada in particular, it's going to be very important to continue to engage with the Chinese Communist Party on issues that directly relate to national strategic you know, interests or national economic interests or broader national interests, and then have discussions around human rights issues in parallel and to not necessarily conflate the two. Because it's going to be very difficult, I think, to continue engagement and with China if at every instance where you sit down to talk about economic issues or trade issues or investment issues, those human rights issues also become uh, an, an issue that needs to be addressed in order to move the, the relationship forward. Now, I think that that's very important for states like Canada and, and Washington to sit down with Beijing and raise issues around Xinjiang in particular, uh, the, the approach that uh, um, the Xi administration has taken. Uh, in that region. Uh, I think that needs to be front and center in discussions, but it doesn't need to hijack the entirety of the relationship. And I think that's that's the important distinction that I tried to make in that article, is that you do have to, to engage with China as China is, not as you would like China to be, and understand that those dialogues, if you are able to disaggregate them to a certain extent, you can still have functional, workable relationships with, with China on issues that are hugely important for, for anyone's national security issues, whether that's climate change, whether that's uh, the pandemic response, which, and of course, you know, development around uh, technology and, and other economic opportunities in the Asia Pacific and, and globally, but at the same time, maintain those more normative discussions uh, in, in appropriate venues in a way that makes sense for your own national values and national norms and, and interests. Thanks. Um, Robert, uh, here's a good question that was uh, sent to us earlier uh, in email from uh, one of our uh, participants. Um, what aspects of Trump era policies towards China, if any, should be maintained by the Biden administration? Well, I tend to focus on defense issues. And just as Rachel was saying, we haven't come up to speed on, on the changing balance of power. Our defense budget and defense acquisitions over the last decade have been going forward as if the rise of China didn't exist. So one place I give the administration credit, as much as it's difficult to do so, is the extent to which they have ridden hard on the Pentagon to reconsider how they're spending their money, both between the services and on what kind of ships in the Navy. 
So the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Millie, said recently that we are short on funds, we have a challenge, and there will be blood on the floor as we reallocate. And what he meant by that is the Army is going to have to experience a significant cutback in funding in order to have adequate funding for the Navy to deal with the rise of China. Too late, but rather, maybe too little too late, but this is the direction we need to move in. Um, other than that, I mean, we can say there ought to be a reset. Um, we can say that they do, were doing good things. Um, but generally, the Trump administration, let's, let's face it, was all about containment. It was across the board containment. It was an all government approach to containment. It was a decoupling approach to containment. We need a technology policy. That means no technology sharing with China. We need to take a second look at our education policy. That means no educational exchanges with China. We need to consider our trade policy with China. That means a trade war with China. We need to consider our military policy. That means getting in China's face in the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait. We need to use Taiwan as a hammer to hit China to contain China. None of those were constructive. China is pushing back on all of those, and the unfortunate reality is they have the ability to push back to impose costs that they didn't in the past, so these policies are failing. So one can say, oh, well, they did a nice job in trying to have a harder line, but being tough is not a strategy. Being tough is not difficult. So with the exception of trying to reconsider our defense priorities and how we allocate money, I'd say it was a total disaster and start over again. Thank you. Um, Rachel, in your policy paper, you recommend the U.S. to rejoin CPTPP and explore joining RCEP. Uh, you also talk about creating global technological standards. In recent years, especially after the COVID pandemic, uh, there is a growing call for decoupling uh, U.S. and Chinese economies, eliminating uh, dependence on Chinese supply chains and blocking use of Chinese technologies. Uh, given these concerns, uh, why do you think strengthening trade relations can help advance U.S. interests? And how do you think these concerns that exist, uh, whether it's around technology or supply chain, can be addressed? Yeah, so I think that, you know, the first problem is that many of these concerns have been overblown um, by the Trump administration. And they, you know, and I think just by American sense of vulnerability during the pandemic and by a sort of rising sense of nationalism and willingness to try to find a foreign enemy. I mean, the, the reality is that U.S. trade with China has been you know, massively beneficial to the United States and to the global economy over the last several decades. Now, of course, there are ways in which that trade with China has, especially in sort of in certain in, in certain communities of the United States, manufacturing communities, et cetera, has had real negative consequences. And I think that where the real failure has been has been among in domestic U.S. political leadership and the failure to really implement the kind of adjustment policies that would be needed to make sure that the gains from that trade, the overall gains from US-China trade are actually distributed fairly among, you know, the among the American people. And this is where I'm hopeful, I'm, I hope that a worker-centered a worker -centered trade policy that the Biden administration you know, claims to be prioritizing will focus is less on sort of punitive trade wars that just hurt Americans and, and, as, and they really don't make sense because they have a bilateral focus when we're a highly integrated world. And it, so you can't you know, try to just influence China's behavior when it has just through some tariffs when it has many outside options. Um, and you know, if, I'm hoping that instead of that kind of approach, we can think about, okay, yes, we do need high standards in, in trade agreements such as CPTPP. And you know, it, there are certain areas in which we need to sort of reset the terms of the US-China relationship. When China came into the WTO, it was a much weaker economy and much less directly competitive to the United States. So the kinds of technology transfer, tra transfer agreements that we had as part of that, which you know, oftentimes the, the term forced technology transfers use, it, it's really actually forced. You know, you know, we agreed to this, companies agree to it when they go into joint ventures with Chinese companies. But you know, at this point, maybe those requirements are too onerous. And now that many Chinese technology companies in particular are, are much more directly competitive. So, so yes, we do need to renegotiate some of the terms of that trade, but it, you know, the, the relationship still has the potential to be vastly beneficial in a whole variety of areas. And I'd, I'd highlight the most, some of the most important ones are in fact medical cooperation and uh, medicines and also clean energy cooperation, where of course there's some competition there, 
But when companies have the ability to work together and to be integrated in supply chains, that has really positive effects on both sides. So, you know, as, when it comes to CPTPP, and see, maybe I have too many P's in there, but <laughs> CPTPP and RCEP, you know, the reason why we advocate rejoining those is that by staying out of them, we're not helping the American people and we're certainly not helping our influence in Asia. On the contrary, we're becoming increasingly marginal and China is increasingly growing its influence. It's obviously in RCEP and now it's exploring the possibility of joining CPTPP. And so if we can get re-engaged in those while pursuing a better domestic economic policy and in fact explicitly linking those, that's what we call for in this report, then I think that we can, we can capture some of those broad benefits um, for the American people and for our geostrategic position. Thank John, you. can I comment on that quickly? Sure, go ahead. Um, Rachel's right. Um, and basically what she's saying is that we need a reset in our economic policies because China's not what it was. And there are certain policies that for an advanced industrial country to pursue gives an unlevel playing field that's simply unacceptable now simply because the cost to the people in the United States of that policy is far greater than it was. And that we need to um, expect China to um, adjust to its own rise. Um, and so no one I think would say that no change is necessary. You know, we do need to um, reset the relationship to reflect China's greater impact on our domestic societies and economies. But the other point of that, that I think Rachel was alluding to is the need to be surgical. We have technological issues. Well, what are the security implications of certain technologies? Focus on those. If there are certain trade issues that there is not a level playing field, focus on those. And so that you can cooperate where it's mutually beneficial, but protect yourself in those select areas where you need to. Again, that's just the total contrary to what the Trump administration did. I think if you read the X article, which has every indication it was written by a former Trump administration official, the, the attempt as go back to 2013, what does that mean? We want to turn back the rise of China. Not possible, Rachel will say. Um, rather, you have to deal with it as it is, and that would require a surgical selective approach to enable us to protect our security while also benefiting from mutual trade cooperation. Um, another important question from our audience. Uh, Jeff, I appreciate if uh, you can answer this question. How do you expect uh, the Biden team to deal with the extradition case of Meng Wanzhou and the arbitrary arrest of Canada's Michael Colbrick and Michael Spear? Uh, well, I think it was within the last couple of days that um, Secretary of State Blinken talked about uh, the need to return hostages of being a priority within uh, his, uh, his approach to foreign policy. I think that bodes well with respect to raising the issue to the level that we would like, at least from a Canadian perspective, with respect to the, the, the two Michaels. Uh, we do want this to be an issue that is raised between the US and China at every possible instance, because we see that you know, the United States is going to be a, a critical partner for, uh, to, to, to achieve, I think, a, a desirable outcome, which of course is their immediate and unconditional release. I'm a little bit concerned um, on having discussed this issue with some people and some, some contacts in Washington, D.C. about the failure, however, of the Biden administration to see the connection between the request for extradition to Meng Wanzhou and the, two detention, the detention of the two Michaels. They, they tend to see these as two separate events, uh, not connected and certainly not uh, worth addressing as a, a singular kind of approach to, to this problem. Uh, we've we've talked to people and raised you know the issue that hey you know we're quite concerned that we're not going to come to an optimal outcome of this situation unless the Meng Wanzhou extradition treaty finds some sort of uh, I think positive outcome from from the perspective of Beijing. So what we really uh, you know advocate is approach this in a in a comprehensive way. Understand that Meng Wanzhou is part of the, this problem, and that the Biden administration is going to have to do some creative thinking about how to get Canada out of a situation that ultimately the Trump administration put it in by making the extradition request in the first place. You know, Canada, of course, is a, a, a valued ally of the United States, and we acted in, in good conscience to the, the extradition request, but it has not been cost free, as is demonstrated in very clear human costs with the two Michaels. So hopefully the, the Biden administration sticks to its word and doesn't just put pressure for the release of the two Michaels, but understands that, you know, to really advance that interest, it's going to have to address the situation with Meng Wanzhou as well. Thank you. Um, Rachel, uh, I'm going to ask another question that our audience submitted. 
Uh, this one is uh, regarding uh, cooperation uh, on uh, basically issues related to uh, climate change uh, pandemic. So uh, and I'm going to paraphrase the question here a bit. Uh, on general direction of the bilateral relations between the US and China, uh, what's your assessment uh, if the issues of areas of potential cooperation such as climate change uh, and, and the fight uh, against the pandemic may overtake areas of likely confrontation, such as uh, disputes in South China Sea, Taiwan, and human rights. Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, debate in this, in the sort of Washington bubble about uh, concerns that were raised during John Kerry's uh, confirmation hearing um, uh, about whether or not, you know, I think Mitt Romney sort of objecting that he was going to try to trade away things uh, in a grand bargain with China for climate cooperation. And, you know, I, I think that there's, I guess there's there's two ways of looking at this. On one level, I think this is very much overblown. And, you know, Kerry has come out since then and made it very clear that there's not going to be any trading the South China Sea for climate, for example, um, that, that, and no one's calling for that. And I, I think that's a little bit of a, a red herring. Um, and so I, I, I think that they will, you know, prioritize, certainly, I think McCary's made it very clear that he's going to prioritize working with China as, among other countries as a way of moving forward a new international uh, climate deal. And I think that's that there's a lot of a lot of opportunities for the US and China to work bilaterally and multilaterally. And I'm, I think that's very encouraging. And I think we will see that, especially because, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of Biden's overall, not just foreign policy, but you know, overall priorities of his administration is to deal in a very comprehensive way with climate change. So, you know, I think I think we will see that. And of course, one of the other four priorities is the pandemic. And I think, you know, it, or Vice President Harris in her presidential debate, a vice presidential debate last fall, you know, criticized the Trump administration for withdrawing um, health, like the CDC officials from Beijing and from being on the ground in Wuhan. So it's clear they've signaled that they want to reestablish those public health ties as well that the Trump administration had, had severed. Um, now, at the same time, I do think that there is a risk that the Biden administration may be a little bit too sanguine about the ability to pursue, pursue strategic competition and achieve the level of cooperation that they might want in some of these other areas. And, you know, it, this is in part because the, the, the Chinese, uh, the, the, the CCP leadership oftentimes really prioritize a very positive, you know, uh, hugs and smiles sort of overall U.S.-China relationship as the backdrop to then strike deals. And you know that maybe that maybe is less the preferred approach of the Biden administration uh, of, of the Biden administration. I don't think they're going to do that. So, um, you know, that also may just be rhetoric on the part of, of of CCP leadership, and we may see them being willing to adopt. You know, sort of at least clearly in the Obama administration, there were several deals struck in the second Obama administration, despite ratcheting of tensions in the strategic and military arena. So I think we'll see that, but there are real dangers from rising military competition. Um, even if you're, even if it doesn't interfere with these, uh, with the actual negotiations over climate change, for example, it can directly drive climate change because it can make China feel more insecure, less willing to rely on, you know, oil imports, and more willing to rely, uh, more determined to rely on, on dirty domestic coal. So there's, there, we need to think about it holistically and realize that, you know, full spectrum military competition can also have negative consequences for climate interests, and and so I, th I hope that they adopt a more holistic approach. Thank you. Um, here's another question from our audience. Uh, Robert, if you would like to answer this question, how durable is the bipartisan consensus in Congress with respect to China? And who are the leaders, uh, I'm going to quote exactly the question that was submitted, who are the leaders responsive to the kind of perspective and arguments made by the panelists? So, um, hello, Paul. How are you? Thank you for the question. Um, the question was submitted by Professor Paul Evans, uh, University of British Columbia. Um, so, part of the question was about the inevitability of strategic competition. Absolutely. I mean, that is not going to go away. Um, the South China Sea has been the cornerstone of American security since World War II. We're, following, we're watching American alliances degrade with the rise of China. We're watching the balance of power in the maritime East Asia shifting in China's favor. The United States is not going to sit by and just watch that happen. It's going to do what it can to maintain, as Rachel was saying, a, a, a balance of power parity in the region 
uh, not necessarily uh, pr uh, primacy, but even just accepting parity will require competition. Now there's a discussion in China and the United States about putting boundaries around that competition so that it doesn't bleed over into other areas. Whether it's climate change, whether it's a new trade agreement, can we deal with each issue on the agenda in a discreet way? And that's, now there are many Chinese who agree with that too, putting boundaries and finding ways to cooperate. The strategic relationship should not necessarily get in the way of that. This is not the Cold War, this is not Europe. The threat perception is far less than it was during the, during the Cold War. But uh, Rachel, Rachel pointed to the reluctance of the party to cooperate. So a recent Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson said, the Americans want to cooperate with us on climate change, but they treat us like a strategic adversary. That's not going to work. So the, again, we need to have that large picture. If we can ratchet down the tension on strategy, it will be in strategic issues. It will be easier to cooperate on the other issues. At the same time, such issues as climate change or pandemics are multilateral issues that will be best addressed not bilaterally, but within multilateral frameworks. And to the extent that we do that, American interest in cooperation and the Chinese response will be seen by European countries, by other countries, and that for China to simply reject American overtures will have a larger price. So there may well be opportunities and China will be willing to cooperate and reach out on these issues, both for US-China relations and for its larger global reputation. Yeah, and I'll, I'll chime in on the on the Congress question. I also, I didn't attend the event, but I read a, a write-up of it afterwards that Professor Reeves refers to, or sorry, um, Evans, Professor Evans refers to. And you know, I, I was also rather discouraged. I think I think if you read what most most uh, members of Congress who are speaking publicly about China have to say, it's oftentimes, uh, you know, I think quite quite uh, towards the strategic adversary, strategic competition side of the of the spectrum, and actually far more far more tilted in that direction than views among the American people. Definitely, American pu public attitudes towards China over the last year have soured significantly. I think mostly because of the pandemic but also the per persistent attention to this issue uh, by President Trump and the sort of rhetoric against China, I think also has, has played a role in this. Um, but so in Congress, there aren't a lot of political incentives for members of Congress to speak up in favor of more cooperative US-China relations. So you don't see a lot of that. That said, there are members of Congress who are more pragmatic. Um, the co-chairs of the US-China Working Group, Representative Rick Larson and Representative Darren LaHood, uh, who are with a Democrat and Republican, they've, they've said, uh, on, on, on a few occasions over the last year that they view themselves as salvagers, that there's a lot of problems with the relationship, but you still have to make it work. You can't pretend that, you know, China doesn't exist or, or try to lock ourselves off from, uh, uh, from, from any sort of engagement or diplomacy with China. You have to salvage the relationship and find the best way to make it work. So I think that there are some more pragmatic types like that in Congress. And, you know, I think that there's, there's really a lot of US-China policy, except for maybe on the Taiwan issue, you know, it, it rests in the executive branch. And so notwithstanding a lot of the, you know, extreme hawkishness that comes out of Congress, I think, um, you know, it, I don't think that's necessarily the, the best indicator of, of where things are headed in the U.S.-China relationship. Um, and I also think that on the progressive side, uh, there's there's a lot of resistance to a Cold War. I mean, I, the, the progressive side of the party pushed really hard um, to, and I think to really great effect to influence the Democratic Party platform which notes a couple of things. First of all, that the US-China competition is not primarily military. It's sort of more economic and technological and sort of um, stress that. And then it also said that the United States or that the Democratic Party will not fall into the trap, fall into the trap of a new Cold War with China. And uh, which is language that um, actually Stephen Wertheim, one of the co-founders of the Quincy Institute and I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times last year. And shortly, shortly after that, Nancy Pelosi, you know, used that same language that we're not going to fall into a trap with uh, trap of a new Cold War. So I think this is something where um, progressive members of Congress, they want to see defense budgets come down. They, they want, you know, the United States to sort of reorient towards a more restrained military strategy abroad. And they see the new Cold War with China sort of standing in the way of that goal. So I think that that's another major area of Congress where um, there's more openness to the ideas we're discussing here. I, I would I just add one really quick thing. Uh, uh, well, I agree 100% with what everybody said here. There's also a component of this that's now starting to bleed over into identity politics. 
And I think you can particularly see that from people like Marco Rubio. And I, I'm reminded of his tweet that he put out in, in November where he said something around Biden's cabin picks went to Ivy League schools, have strong resumes, and they go to all the right conferences. But I have no, no interest in watching them make America decline. Uh, um, I don't want to return to what we did with China. So there's now this kind of sense of rhetoric coming out of certain parts of the Republican Party where we talk about engagement with China as almost an elite activity that have, you know, and tie it back to the socioeconomic development issues in the United States that have resulted from globalization and, and pinning all of the hardship that I think, you know, in, in many instances is rightfully identified as resulting from, from un, kind of fettered globalization and tying it back into this idea of US-China relations. So any talk of normalization, even if it is along pragmatic lines, it does provide a degree of ammunition to the more kind of nationalist rhetoric coming out of certain aspects of the Republican Party that want to see, you know, that they want to continue China uh, or Trump's kind of China uh, approach to the bilateral relationship in a way that um, kind of raises their, their nationalist uh, uh, credentials. Uh, but also makes it much more difficult to come to some sort of pragmatic accord across issues of trade or you know investments uh, across issues of of education and uh, cooperation in, in research and development all those things i think have become uh, to a degree a tool of nationalism for for certain parts of the republican party thank you jeff um and uh with that we come to the end of this panel discussion i would like to once again uh thank our panelists for their time and for providing us with their expert analysis on this important topic. Uh, the video of this discussion will be posted on our website and YouTube channel. Also make sure you visit our website and check out upcoming panels we're hosting next week, both on February 8th and February 10th. For details and to register, make sure you visit our website. It's www.peacediplomacy.org. Thank you for watching and hope to see you soon at our next panel.